Hey, hi everyone. Uh, we're just getting some attendees trickling in, which is great. So just to confirm, this is the breakout session with Jessica Schumlich. Um, so if you did join this one in air, um, that's fine. You can just click leave and then go back to the auditorium and select the panelists that you um, were intending to join. So we'll just give everyone a couple more, a minute or so here. But don't do that because you'll hurt my feelings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Okay, so we have 15, 16 in so far, um, Jessica, so we probably could get started. Okay, so um, if everyone, oh, we have one already. So we can use the, we'll be using the Q&A um, function uh, for the questions here. So you can put a question um, in the box. So I guess the first one we have, Jessica's uh, more of a comment, which is thanks for sharing your inspiring story. So yeah, it was great to hear a little bit of, um, of your a sampling of your story in the group panel. So um, yeah, if you want to tell us a little bit more about it, and then as questions come up, um, I can just fire them off to you. Does that sound good? Sure. Uh, do you want me to handle stick handle these uh lisa or do you want are you going to ask me them or how do you want to handle this <laughs> i'm fine yeah i'm fine with um answering them if it's less less of a distraction and you can just talk or if you are are comfortable with zoom and want to do it whatever is most comfortable for you yeah sure i, I mean i guess i can start speaking to them i have the uh multiple screens here so I've seen okay. I'm seeing them come sure. up so um, speaking to the MBA experience how it helped you launch um, my business um, so I actually didn't get an MBA uh, I was like I don't want an MBA I went back and got a master's of management specializing in economic development because I was really passionate about um, you know building a sustainable future and, and I thought economic development was the right path for me so I actually did um uh the the master's part-time while still working um and honestly if i remove everything i actually learned uh from a from a uh actual academic perspective what i learned is to believe in myself i learned that there were other people who were doing things in in regional economic development and sustainability um and i didn't see any reason why i couldn't also be that person and so um it inspired me to 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 start to believe in myself to start to seek out people outside of oil and gas i had never worked outside of oil and gas so i didn't know what that was like i didn't even realize that that was possible you know having uh, spent my entire career here so um, that helped. And then additionally, um, just seeing other people who had started businesses and starting to build that network. Um, sure, there was some, you know, important skill sets from the from the actual academic perspective, learning how to, you know, manage finance sheets and, and you know, all those sorts of things. But in reality, it was the confidence. Um, so I hope that answered that question. Um, the next thing is, when you pivoted into emissions management, what sort of branding did you do? Oh, that's a funny question. Um, I'm an engineer. I'm terrible at everything visual. Uh, but luckily, my business partner is not. Um, so I mean, if you're going to start your business, first thing I would say, if that's something you're interested in, um, getting uh, other people who have different and complementary skill sets um, for you uh, is is great. I don't think I ever would have had the confidence to start my business by myself. Um, having a, a really awesome business partner was key. And he's all about branding and all about um, advertisements and, and making sure that we had a solid uh, uh, sort of launch into market. Starting a company in COVID isn't easy. You can't take people out for coffee. You can't go and, um, you know, meet people face to face and build the relationships that you really want to. So we had to rely on our branding and marketing. And so um, we, we did a lot of stuff. Um, if anybody is interested, you can go to um, our website, highwoodemissions.com uh, and sort of see some of the stuff that we did. But we were very intent. We hired a um, a, a firm to do our branding. Um, we went out and paid a photographer to go and take pictures. We did we did a lot of uh, a lot of stuff on that. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Uh, the next question is: What kind of specific skills are required for a process engineer who's pivoting from oil and gas? Um, 
and uh, let's see here. Okay, there we go. Um, so, I mean, honestly, specific skill sets. I think a process engineer has the specific skill sets to do it. They understand, you know, how the molecules are moving from the different, um, you know, facilities and 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 how they get, uh, you know, from from a a production uh, well site, you know, to a production facility, and then, you know through the entire value chain. Um, I think it's a matter of then just learning how to do the, the quantification. So when you burn you know, a, a gigajoule or a meter cubed of gas, how does that actually result in, in, in the emissions? And, and I think that's a skill that, that's learnable. So you're 95% you're of the way um, there if you're already a process engineer. I think the idea of us believing in ourselves that we have the skill sets um, is, is really important. And so, um, to whomever on that or Yasha, I guess, um, you know, believe in yourself. And, and, and I think you already have a lot of those skill sets. Um, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for attending. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, are you finding a pushback on emissions reductions from anyone? What do you find is your biggest hurdle? Um, I think the oil and gas sector is changing, um, honestly. Uh, I think that um, there are companies who are doing phenomenal work in the emissions management space. And those are the companies who we're working with. Those are the companies who are seeking us out um, for our services. And so it's, uh, it's really great to see. Um, the biggest hurdle um, in terms of, I'm not sure if you mean by starting a business or if you mean in terms of getting work or if you mean in terms of like convincing people that they need to, um, <laughs> they need to uh, manage their emissions. I can kind of try to answer all of those, but I think um, the real value add that we can pitch to clients is, is um, I think nobody wants to be the person who's who's you know who's left behind, and so um, emissions are important for oil and gas companies to consider for a lot of reasons. Um, chiefly, you know, you can talk about the economics of it, right? You can say investors are looking at um, emissions uh, reduction uh, companies, and 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 people are getting more investment when they're managing those properly. There's regulatory requirements that come at real cost, and if you're not managing to those regulatory requirements, that is going to cost you money, either um, you know directly as a compliance cost or or potentially even as an enforcement. Um, and so there's different ways that you can that you can say that, um, and then of course also. So, you know, making sure that you offer some, some light at the end of the tunnel as well, too. And, and that's where we come in, right? So um, that's, uh, that's, that's probably the biggest hurdle. Um, companies' biggest hurdle, I think, especially the smaller oil and gas companies, um, are that they don't have people who will have the expertise to do emissions management. And so um, we're able to come in, Highwood is able to come in and say, you know, we can take that all off um, and we can do so in a cost-effective way. And I think that really resonates with uh, the smaller companies who who are just worried about keeping the lights on, who are working on um, production and, 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 and um, you know, making money so that they can continue to pay their employees. And so um, that's one thing that I, I, I'm really able to offer clients is we can do it, we can do it cost effective, we can find you money, um, we can really show that there's a business case for the emissions reductions. Um, next question, um, you had mentioned a few different positions prior to starting your own. How did you identify the gaps you wanted to fill in those? And if you had gaps, how did you sell yourself for those jobs? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I had worked for an oil and gas company, and I think a lot of um, emissions management comes with regulatory. Um, uh, and so the regulatory bodies in Alberta, obviously Alberta Environment and Parks and, and um, the AER uh, are key governing bodies. And so when I decided I wanted to start my own company, um, I knew that I needed to have also the regulatory um, or the regulator um, experience, or at least that's what I wanted to do um, because I wanted to be able to speak from both sides. I wanted to say, well, you know, having been a regulator as well as having worked in oil and gas. Um, and so uh, I went and um, identified that gap and then sought out opportunities. I know we can't do this now, but honestly, how I got my job at the regulator is I saw the regulator 
presenting at a conference. I took the day off of work. I attended that conference, paid for it by myself, and went up to the head of the regulator and said, hello, my name's Jessica, and I want to work for you. And then I submitted my resume and uh, got the interview and, 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 and got the job. So um, that's probably one of the scariest things I've ever done, but I did it and, and, and it worked. And so then I was able to get that, uh, that experience. And, and so I, I decided to, to do that. And, and, and how do you sell yourself? I identified skills that I thought were transferable from um, my previous job working for a big oil and gas company to the regulator um, and realized that I had a lot more to offer than I than I thought, you know, even in the terms of, of risk management, of project management, of all of those things. So um, moving on to the next question. Uh, you've worked in oil and gas for 14 years and you were laid off. Um, you completed a certificate in mining supervisor. You have your first job interview tomorrow. It's based in a small town in the Kootenays. It'd be a change. You're anxious um, about it. Uh, you want to go in prepared. You're interested in emissions management, but only um, want to take a specialized course rather than go back to school full time. Any specific courses you recommend online? Ooh. Uh, no, um, honestly, I'm not really sure <laughs> that there is a, a, a course on emissions management that I'd be able to recommend. Um, what I can do, um, Ilveris, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but um, send me a note maybe on LinkedIn and what I can do is give you a bunch of really good reference material um, to just get you started uh, in learning uh, the journey. I've, I've come to, with a little bit of, um, you know, documents or papers and, you know, best practices, these sorts of things. And I think some self-study is, is the best recommendation. So I'll throw that out to anyone. If anybody wants to add me on LinkedIn and they're interested in learning, um, I can throw you a few, uh, a few reference documents and, and, and that's a, a really good start. Um, there are a lot of funding opportunities out there for emissions reductions. Do you think there'll be continued funding? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I hope so. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. I mean, it, it like continued, it depends what you mean, but uh, I certainly think that it's a focus area and, and, you know, with commitments to the Paris Accord and with commitments of, um, you know, companies going to net zero and with Canada's ambitious uh, uh, emissions reduction targets, um, I'm hoping to see continued funding. It's, it's a really important component of, um, of uh, helping companies make the transition. Um, I also see funding um, being uh, uh, huge in, in two different things that are maybe not funding in terms of like direct funding programs, but the um, Alberta offset system and the Canadian offset system, as well as the developing markets in Saskatchewan and, and uh, uh, British Columbia, I think will help drive emissions um, reductions and as well as the idea of differentiated gas. So um, uh, companies getting a premium for their low carbon fuel. Um, and then as well too, just, you know, seeing investment opportunities occur with companies that have the lowest carbon um, uh, uh, footprint, I think are all going to be big driving um, forces if there isn't actually, um, you know, direct funding, but those are all helping um, these companies transition and will continue to do that. Um, you mentioned uh, your company has four employees. Did you find it difficult to build your list of clients? Is your company, company mainly working in Alberta or other provinces in Canada? Um, uh, yeah, it was hard, um, but it was also not easy. Um, it, was, it was challenging. My first clients were friends, honestly, who, who took a risk, uh, who gave me a little piece of work. So I was able to say, yeah, I've worked in industry before. I've been a consultant, you know, running my own business before. And, and that's always <laughs> the hardest thing then to translate that and get it into other work. And so initially when I launched my company with my business partner, we went into, um, we went into uh, you know a business development phase where we identified all of our clients. Um, we 
did our pitches, we did our business plan, we spent, you know, months honing, uh, honing that pitch and months identifying our client groups and then decided to reach out to all of those when we finally felt like we were ready. Um, one of the panelists said, um, you know, if you're reaching out to your network, don't ask for a job, you know, ask for um, you know, ask for something else. And, and that's what I did. So even though I knew I was starting my own business and I wanted to get these clients that I was meeting with, I didn't ask for work. I went to them and said, I'm starting my own business. What are your pain points? And we had already identified, um, my business partner and I had identified pain points that we thought these people were, these companies were having, but we decided to go and confirm them. So the first meeting was just, hey, we're launched and we're trying to make sure that we develop um, uh, things like services that, that that clients actually want. So, you know, tell me what you're struggling with. And then we redefined our pitches and, and, and eventually a month, two months, six months uh, later, these, these companies came back and said, hey, I remember we had the chat and I'm actually looking for emissions management services. Um, so it's a long journey, but it, but it, um, it, it is paying off. So um, everything you said resonates with my journey, um, linking my skill sets as a geological technologist to solving pain points into emissions management. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Alberta regulator. Um, so I worked for um, Energy Efficiency Alberta and I've done some um, other work with, uh, with some other um, agencies. So <laughs> that's a, a, okay, Alberta regulator. Greenhouse Gas Management Institute presents some online courses. Thank you, Asha, yeah. Um, I noticed you're offering a course on April 27th, 2021. Yes, sorry, I am offering a course on emissions management um, 2021. So thanks for pointing that out. I, I, uh, I didn't forget about that, but I, uh, it wasn't just in the back of my mind. So um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, if anybody's interested in that, feel free to reach out, but that's actually through JWN um, Energy um, uh, through the company that, uh, that BMO. Um, is working with so uh, that will be cool it's just a one day half day course um, okay sorry ignore that question um, Jessica you are more entrepreneurial than me I'm a reservoir engineer by background and have been trying to pivot into sustainable development um, but I'm finding it difficult to get into this space where my interests lie perhaps lack of opportunity lack of professional network what do you think are the opportunities in this space in Calgary um, I think this is one of the only um, areas uh, for now although we'll see um, but at least in the last year that that was kind of sustained um, in terms of you know oil and gas companies um, I think there are lots of opportunities, but then again, it, it's I guess getting your get it, getting your foot in the door. So um, I, I think you know doing the research, um, doing a lot of self study, um, you know, is important, um, as well as maybe identifying a company that you want to work for and looking what your skill sets are, um, and then maybe pivoting into that skill set. If, if you say that you're not a, uh, you know, entrepreneurial, say you've got a company that, that does really good work, they have good emissions profiles, and they're looking for a reservoir engineer, maybe you start as a reservoir engineer and then pivot internally. Um, once you get that, uh, we all know that, you know, whatever the stat is, 90 or 95% of the jobs are, are internal jobs. So um, perhaps a lot of the, um, you know, environmental type jobs in, in companies are not um, are not externally advertised. So that might be one option. Um, but I think there are growing opportunities, especially as we see, you know, carbon markets and differentiated gas and, and investment dollars coming to those companies who have those low GHG um, footprints. Um, but I would just advise, you know, getting, reaching out and, and asking for a virtual coffee for um, as many people as you can to understand what their journey is. And, and who knows, maybe one of those connections will, will turn into something. Um, on your, uh, Dave, on your website, you have a research tab and you're looking at emissions management applications outside of uh, oil and gas, such as uh, CO2 tail gas capture reduction upscaling. Um, so we honestly have not uh, ventured into that uh, field 
as of yet. Our focus right now is primarily methane and, and sort of greenhouse gas emissions in general, but primarily methane. So the research that we actually do is what we've partnered with PCHAC Petroleum Technology Alliance of Calgary and the University of Calgary um, to look at uh, leak detection and repair simulation. Um, so understanding um, the measurement aspect of, uh, of uh, methane emissions that in oil and gas. Um, so that's currently what our research is, but um, we're very well aware that, you know, methane is something that occurs now and it's very important to solve and it's the low hanging fruit. But my vision is solving the methane problem in you know five years and ten years, however long it takes. And then there's going to be other things that we're looking at as well too. I see a huge um, market in in terms of um, CO2 capture, especially you know in the distributed um, side of things. So being able to do it in a small scale, micro scale, um, we're seeing very large investments in CO2 uh, capture as well too, um, largely uh, in in Canada and throughout the world, and that's really exciting. Um, but I think until we're able to do that on a small scale, um, you know, that's, uh, that's really going to be a game changer. So um, I'm in the exploration stage now after losing my job. I am a chemical process engineer having worked with EPCs and owners. I'm taking a course in carbon capture and storage. Do you see opportunities? Uh, yeah, so I think I just um, kind of hit that with the last question, but certainly we're going to see, um, or I project seeing a, a big um, uptake in, in, in CCUS. And um, I think that's great. Um, and certainly room. So I hope I answered that question already. What type of training is available here in Canada? I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer to this question. Um, like I said before, there is that um, uh, half uh, day course that, that JWN and myself are offering in, in about uh, two months from now. Um, other than that, um, I, I honestly don't really know, I, I think, you know, having the technical skill sets, the risk management skill sets, the ability to, you know, um, address problems and these sorts of things is is the biggest component of it. And then getting a little bit of experience um, in in the side once you've sort of developed a little bit more of an understanding of emissions management. But um, yeah, that's it's it's I don't I don't have a short term course I think that you could take you know here's here's a I'm just thinking out loud maybe here's something um with the new uh requirements for um for for tier which is the technology uh innovation of an environment regulation uh, what has replaced CCR and SGR anyway there's a verification component requirement for um, verifying greenhouse gas emissions and, and that was always the case in the former regulation but anyway the verification aspect of greenhouse gas emissions is really important so there's um, there's ISO international standard association courses in terms of greenhouse gas um, verification that might be uh, something that you could potentially look, look into um, how to know your skills and what market how to know your skills? How do you know your? I think that's the question. How do you know your skills, and and what are the market needs? Um, I'm going to try to answer that question. I'm not exactly sure what you're getting at, but I'll I'll do my best. Um, again, asking people what their pain points are, and 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 trying to figure out how uh, you can help them with those pain points. So yeah, it's one thing to say, you know, I want to become a surf instructor, but you know. I think looking in Alberta, there's not really a lot of job opportunities for surf instructors. So um, not only understanding what your ambition is, but also if there's a market um, for what you what you want to offer are very important. And how do you do that? Uh, you know, ask ask people what their pain points are. Um, have real conversations like that. Um, and I think you'll you'll start to help that, and then you'll start to sort of identify what are your skills that you can help address those pain points. Um, are you focusing on Alberta oil and gas companies for GHG reduction? Or are you looking at different uh, markets and industries outside of that? Um, so th to answer your question, um, yes to, to both of those. Um, <laughs> 
when my business partner and I first started, we had quite a broad view of who our potential clients would be. And we decided to throw some spaghetti at the wall and see what stuck. And um, a lot of different things have stuck, but what we've learned over the last, you know, six months to a year um, when we've been trying to start this company is that um, we want to be really good at a few specific things. Um, and that was more important than being sort of, you know, a generalist. We want to be those emissions expertise, the, the methane expertise. And so right now our focus is um, in Alberta and our focus is oil and gas, but that's just to get our, that's to get our offering great, you know, really define it, work in an area that we know before we um, expand. Um, we already uh, have uh, a few U.S. clients uh, that we're working on signing contracts with. I think we've already got one signed. Um, we're also working um, outside of the upstream oil and gas. We're looking at some midstream and downstream um, folks as well, too. Certainly, emissions management is way broader than oil and gas. Um, it's very transferable, but that's what I know right now and so that's what I'm working on um that's what I'm working on perfecting before I I, I really expand that said if if a, if a if a company who works in a different industry comes and asks for support I'm definitely going to evaluate the opportunity but I want to make sure that I um know what I'm doing first before going out and seeking those opportunities um, before you started your business, did you look for a feasibility study to predict the success, cost, revenue, and targets? And where did you get the feasibility study? No, I didn't do a feasibility study um, officially. Uh, that said, um, I uh, did a lot of work on understanding what were the initial products and services I wanted to offer with my business partner, who were our um, market uh, targets, our, 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 um, our clients that we wanted to target. We identified five, uh, five key client areas. Um, we also did, you know, cash flow projections and, and these sorts of things to try to figure out what was sustainable. Um, and I also, <laughs> you know, decided that I had to be okay um, and, and was okay, you know, with the financial implications of, of not working. Um, I've had to uh, rely on my wonderful husband um, during this this time and, and I had to be okay with that. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I had to look at my lifestyle and, and figure out what I what I could afford and what I couldn't. And, and so um, I didn't know if this was gonna be successful. There was no, you know, silver lining that said yes or no. Um, I still don't even know if this is gonna be successful. I'm very, very hopeful, but um, I, I don't know. Um, it's hard and, you know, I'm grinding every day and, and having lots of business doesn't necessarily always translate into revenue as well too, especially when you're trying to grow the business and, and um, invest in employees and these sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, I think I've spoken to the um, risk bit uh, uh, in my previous uh, discussions, but I had to be okay with 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 some risk and, and some unknown. And um, I work my butt off and, and so does my business partner. And, and eventually we just had to take that leap of faith. So um, I hope that helped. Uh, there's a large untapped pool of industries looking to um, sectorial decrease carbonized such as agriculture I've been following nutrien yeah absolutely I think <laughs> nutrients a great a great example um, of of this yeah there's lots of other industries as well um, like I said it's a conscious choice to not chase after those uh, right now um, I'm trying to focus on what I'm doing and, and and doing it well and and training staff to be able to you know do it well and be sustainable and repeatable and all of those things um, and I'm hoping that that um, will uh, will eventually you know go broader but but at this point um i was struggling with scope creep for lack of better words with all of the potential opportunity areas and so really just really just trying to hone down uh, on one right now before we look to to further um further expand we want to go deep now before we go broad um so that we don't make mistakes such as you know what what are the right, you know, how do you cost your services? What services do you want to offer? These sorts of things going into a new market, we want to do so um, in a calculated manner as opposed to um, um, on a haphazard manner because there might be an opportunity. So um, I've registered a 
company but have difficulties reaching out and getting contracts for my business. Please advise on the best approach to secure contracts. Um, for me, again, it was it was leveraging my network and, and starting with just um, asking the question about um, about uh, how do I um, uh, how do I get started? What are your pain points? What are the the the, the pain points that you feel? And then um, taking those pain points and translating those into service offerings. And so, I think the first and most important thing um, is uh, is understanding the pain points of the clients. What are you What are you trying to sell? Um, and then um, developing those those service offerings. Um, so I guess that would be the advice: is 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 no what value you bring to the table um, and, and, uh, and, and really focus on that and, and developing a really good product. Uh, is it official for Alberta to reduce methane emissions by 45% by 2025? So the need is out there, eh? Um, I think it's 45% by 2030, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, that said, yes, <laughs> there's lots of opportunity. Methane is low hanging fruit and there's lots of funding opportunities as well too available for people um, in oil and gas, especially to, um, to, uh, to reduce opportunities. So, um, or to reduce their methane. So yeah, I believe this industry is 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 growing um, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, and then the other question, um, are there any volunteer opportunities out there for technical skilled people wanting to go into the emissions business? Um, I don't know. Uh, the answer to that question. Um, I wonder, I mean, I'm just brainstorming here, but we, we talked about, especially uh, Ross mentioned this, let's, let's get creative about this. So I'm thinking about let's get creative for this um, question. I mean, what about reaching out to maybe a nonprofit and, and saying, hey, can I help with an emissions quantification or something like that, that you can put in your annual report? I bet you um, maybe some of these, you know, nonprofits or community organizations or these sorts of things might appreciate, you know, some some help or support and maybe there's the opportunity to learn um, on that, um, you know, get involved with a community association. Are they doing a greenhouse gas analysis of their activities? Um, I'm not sure, but I haven't um, uh, done that, but I, I think there's there's could be opportunities. I for myself have volunteered with a bunch of organizations that um, do greenhouse gas well don't do greenhouse gas emissions but focus on you know green living and sustainability and these sorts of things um one of which was um green calgary um and the other one was bike calgary and so uh, i was able to leverage some of my emissions knowledge um to help both of those organizations so yeah i certainly think there could be there could be opportunities um sounds like you need a good resource to help you guys broaden and avoid scope creep after you have honed deepened your expertise when you guys are ready. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, HK, yeah, we are definitely uh, uh, one of the cool things that I've been doing lately is, is chatting with other CEOs on on their lessons learned. Um, if I can learn lessons from other people um, and and avoid some of the pitfalls, it's always better because there certainly are pitfalls and, and mistakes that that I make every single day, and 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 that's okay. And and maybe we'll make the mistake of not going into new markets quick enough, and maybe we'll make the mistake of going into markets too quick, and only time will tell. But at least I can you know educate myself on 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 the pros and cons to all of that, and make a conscious choice on what's right for me. So. So Jessica, just um, going back to uh, the panel earlier today, you mentioned that when um, you kind of took a, a good look at what skills do I have and what, what do I want to be when I grow up um, question. Uh, so what did that look like for you? Like, did you just um, kind of jot it down or how did you approach that and, and get a plan forward? You know, um... <laughs> Confidence is a is a funny thing. Um, I think what really happened was the realization that nobody could manage my career except for myself. Um, you know, having a big company uh, behind you can can be sort of a safe 
space but then all of a sudden when it's when it's not anymore you realize that you're actually in charge of your own destiny um it's a really you know it hits you with a ton of bricks and and um i think long story short um i as, as, as Eva mentioned so eloquently in, in the previous panel, I took a really long, hard look at myself and what I wanted and what my goals were and what my skill sets were and, and what I wanted to achieve. You know, if, if I wanted to, you know, make a bunch of money and, 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 and do these things, I probably wouldn't be where I am now and would be taking other opportunities. Um, if I needed the, you know, financial security of, 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 you know, guaranteed income, I, I probably wouldn't be taking the risks now, but I realized that um, I, I wanted to be in a point where I could take risks and that was important to me. I wanted to grow a business. I wanted to, you know, mentor uh, young people who were um, excited to, you know, to grow their careers. Um, these were all really important things to me and, and I decided that owning a business was was the best way to do that. I value autonomy, um, I think, more than security. Not to say that a company job provides you any security because it doesn't, but um, yeah, it's a, I wanted to be able to look in the mirror and say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing this for me. And so that was important. And so I, I, I felt like an entrepreneur um, fit that skill set. And it's not for everyone. It, it certainly isn't as, as I think it was John who was mentioning, um, you have to be so cutthroat and you have to, um, you know, make really difficult decisions um, every single day and you have to grind and push and, you know, um, and make mistakes and and it's and it's it's really hard to do and it's just it's not for everyone. There's other skill sets that are that are that are awesome that I that I don't have that that don't fit. Um, you know, uh, maybe working for a big company and so it's just really having that hard look at myself and what I wanted. Nice. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned that you did formally launch in the fall, which was mid mid pandemic. Well, we don't know how long the pandemic's truly lasting, so it might be early pandemic. Hopefully, it'll be mid only. But um, that must have obviously been a hard choice. So, how did you and your business partner decide to just go for it? There's no time like the present, right? <laughs> I mean, I think it was um, it was really the pandemic that almost helped me um, have the confidence to do it. I could not control the pandemic. I could not control, um, you know, being able to see my family. I couldn't control, you know, the finances of 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 myself and my life and and these sorts of things when the pandemic started there was just there was so much unknown I couldn't control if I was going to be able to you know go on the trip that I had planned in a month or whatever that was and uh, initially I was really really upset by that it, it, it impacted me deeply um, and I started to you know feel bad for myself and 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 that was just a really unhealthy place to be I realized that very quickly and so I decided to say you know there are a few things that I do have control of and 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 most of I, I can't but I can control you know starting my own business and so um why not why not give it a try um and and take a risk and you know life is unpredictable and this is going to be probably the most unpredictable thing I'll I'll ever do um maybe short of kids but um there's, there's no time like now. And I'm, and I'm done making excuses because I don't know if in six months from now or a year from now, or whenever this pandemic is done, what life is going to look like. You just need to put yourself out there. I don't want to be somebody who said I should have done that. I think a lot of people at the beginning of the pandemic said I should have taken that trip. I should have spent more time with family. I should have, I should have, I should have enough, enough. I should have, I did. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I know that you got, yeah, uh, we all are experiencing a lack of control for those of us that are more used to having some control, but um, I think you're right. The concept of starting something new and, and not knowing and going for it um, would also be kind of liberating at the same time. So yeah, that's very neat. 
Um, okay, I was also going, I know we touched in the in the larger panel about um, networking having such a huge value um, for entrepreneurs, but did you have any specific um, like networking tactics or groups or anything that you found really beneficial that you could share with some of our attendees? Um, yeah, I think uh, a few a few comments on this. Um, whatever industry you're working in, um, there's probably industry associations um, that exist. Um, and so for myself, uh, I got really involved with PTEC, the Petroleum Technology Alliance of Canada. Um, there's volunteer positions that exist at that organization. Um, and so, you know, getting involved with the committees, um, going to all of the seminars, you know, participating in the chats, um, you know, even now there's a bunch of these industry associations who are still having the virtual events and, it sucks and you know everybody hates them <laughs> because they're virtual and you can't really get the feel for people but you know do them anyway um show up and you know go to those tables on the screen and you know meet people and and it's 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 the only thing that we have uh now so so whatever industry you're in or whatever industry you want to get into um i would suggest reaching out to the industry associations if you're interested in entrepreneurship there's a lot of really good ones too there's rain uh forest cafe um there's the um startup calgary there's um uh the uh, uh a bunch of um accelerators as well too there's probably eight or ten of them um but anyway it, it, they all run um events you know one-off events or or even some longer term sort of weekly events that um that build on each other and so yeah just figure it figure out that industry and figure out um who's having events at, at that time and and then volunteer as well too um if you have the opportunity or the capacity to do that um it's it's important and you can really gain a, a great network Okay, awesome. Um, yes, we just have, I guess, a comment um, saying to, that you're very inspiring and thank you for sharing your insights. So yeah, that's great to thank hear. Um, I guess I also think your story about um, taking the day off and going to the a AER conference and just um, being bold is, is really cool. <laughs> I think that that's um, like the kind of, uh, you know, the recommendation to do something that scares you right um at the time it can seem like like such a daunting task but a lot of um again it's a little different currently with the pandemic happening but i think that um generally like people like to um to share what they've done or how they've got there. So, um, you know, approaching someone and just being bold to say, hey, I'm interested in your organization and I can offer something um, that original, like uh, right, right off the bat puts you ahead because they think, hey, this person did something instead of them having to go through a stack of resumes, someone just came to them, right? So I think that's a pretty, um, a pretty bold way to start, but it's also um, can be really effective and it was in your case. So I think that's a neat thing to share with the attendees. Um, so if any, if we don't have any other questions. Um, let's see here. I have one, I'll give you one more tip um, that somebody told me that I really relate to. Um, if you do reach out to somebody, um, you know, reach out, of course, with that, um, you know, with that ask or with that, you know, something to offer just as just as the panelist in the previous discussion had. But if you're doing a blind reach out, like somebody who you haven't met before, if it's if it's a cold call, for lack of better words, um, first of all, don't be afraid to do that. But make sure you do your research and make sure you have a, a specific ask. And if you don't hear back the first time, ask a second time. Often, you know, people might get a ton of emails um, and, and might just, you know, forget miss it you know oh this person wasn't really serious but if you reach out again that shows that you're committed and that you really you know want to learn from from that individual and so try again great yes that is an awesome tip so if we don't have any more questions in the queue then we probably can wrap up um, our session a little bit early um so 
Thanks so much, Jessica, for taking the time to um, share your story with everyone in your journey today. Um, and it is a leap of faith to take the plunge um, with that career transition and in your case, starting a new business. So it, I think it will be very inspiring for um, our attendees to hear from one of their peers of exactly how they did it. So yeah, so that was awesome and really enjoyed hearing your story. Um, so just a couple housekeeping stuff for our attendees. Uh, we're going to head into a break now. So um, this is the only period today where the booths will be opened. So feel free to go to the information hall and chat live with any of the booth attendees if you want some more information. And you can also add anything, any of the resources to your virtual briefcase and then um, it can be downloaded or emailed to yourself um, and you can also use the leave a message function um, if you are have a question for one of the booths outside of the open booth time so we will be back in the auditorium at 1 p.m um, for our next session so enjoy your break and thanks everyone and thanks again jessica nice to meet everyone bye okay take care